you're enjoying Racing World, it's brought to you by Perspective Group. It's your global motorsport podcast show brought to you in conjunction with Race Control Magazine. Driver News is the theme again today, and this time, however, there are some firm deals in place and some surprises as well. It was the final IndyCar race of the season, the NTT IndyCar Series wrapping up what was a fabulous season. It was also the final ever V8 Supercar round to be held at the famous Pukekohe Circuit in New Zealand, and the Western Spring Speedway in New Zealand is about to kick off, and there's some big names are coming. It's Racing World for mid-September 2022. Well, there's plenty of news, that's for sure. And there's news that developed just this morning. But we're going to get to that a little later in the show because we're going to do things in the order in which they happened. And the first up, it was the final round of the NTT IndyCar Series. Five drivers in contention for the title, mathematically three. There had been seven the week before, but it shows you the depth and strength of this series. And I've said it time and time again, this has to be rated as one of the world's best series that there is for single-seater drivers and you can take your super license points FIA and you can well you can do whatever you like with them because in my eyes this series counts and super license points become a bit of a joke they really do but more on that later on to the IndyCar series final it was fantastic and it all kicked off at Laguna Seca on the Friday afternoon. So a short session for the IndyCars greeted them on Friday afternoon at Laguna Seca, one of two sessions that it got for practice plus of course qualifying. But the big thing that came out of this session was tyre degradation and how quickly the red tyre particularly wore on this a very abrasive track surface and also if you went, well we'll call it rally crossing off the circuit, track limits if you want to call it the European name, but bottom line was the gravel, the dust and everything else, if you went over the edge of the track you were going to pay the price and tyre wear was going to be the thing in this race for sure and it came out via this practice session. The Reds potentially only had three or four laps in them and yet teams were going to need to make them last at least 12 come race time and the black tyre wasn't a hell of a lot better but it was certainly going to be the tyre to have. I got the chance on the Friday to speak to both Scott McLaughlin and Will Power about this very subject. And David Turner, you've been patiently waiting. David, go ahead. Uh, thanks very much, Dave. Might as well do this one to Scott McLaughlin, seeing as he's just arrived. There's a lot of talk about this tyre degradation and everything. I'd like to know if the track was resurfaced, because there's been talk of resurfacing this track, how quick is the impact in terms of what that does to how the tyres perform? Is it uh, the next year it's fantastic again, or does it take time to rubber back up? Uh... I think the pace will be up, obviously, but the, it's going to be interesting like when the resurface is done and then when we get here because a place like this degrades over time. And I think, you know, you, we might, yeah, it might be resurfaced, but, um, you know, there's a lot of cars that run on this track like, outside of our series. So I think, um, you know, it all depends on sort of when people uh, run and how many people run here. But I think it's definitely going to be better in some ways, but I, I tend to like I'm actually really enjoying like the way that you got to drive the car. I think it's, um, you know, I, I, I'm kind of low key sad that they're going to resurface because it's, it's kind of fun. And um, you got to really like think about like the pitch of the car and, and what you're doing with the car and, and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it is, it is what it is. But like, and, and a resurfacing will be good for the longevity of the track. But um, yeah, I'd love to just keep running on the old, old stuff. Oh, you'll be pleased to know your old car at Pukekohe is doing very well with Di Pasquale taking the top time yesterday. So that's a bit of news from New Zealand for you. Great. No worries. Thanks, and, man. Uh, um, Will, just quickly to you before I, I let other people have a go here. Um, I just wondered, with the high tyre deck that we're getting on the reds and stuff and the number of cars that went off in that practice session, do you feel that the race is going to be impacted by a lot of yellows, which will then determine your strategy? Mm, actually, it hasn't historically been a very yellow race, so it's a good question. It's hard to say. I mean, nothing's really changed, so you'd think it'd be a normal race, but you never know in this game. It can be, you know, it can be a lot of yellow, so we just have to see. Okay, well, all the best to all of you for the weekend, and uh, sorry that I'm not, I'm not there, but uh, I'm looking forward to watching uh, the rest of the weekend unfold. 
Very interesting words, and it meant that there was going to be a great weekend ahead, that was for sure. So onwards then to qualifying before the second practice, and it was willpower that made history, beating Mario's long-standing record and making him the greatest pole sitter in IndyCar history. Well done. Bonus point. Very critical when it came to the championship chase. That was the first bonus point that he could get over the weekend, and one point has made the difference in this championship before. For Newgarden, of course, he had issues at the corkscrew, beaching the car up there, which pushed him ultimately to the back of the field, and that would impact the championship scenario for him as well. As for the other championship contenders, Ericsson, pretty average performance. Dixon, only a 13th, so again, an average performance, and it seems to have been the hoodoo this year for Ganassi, and that's qualifying. McGoughlin, he was still in there as well. So there was a great chance for all five of these guys to be in there. And of course, all eyes would be centered around Joseph to see whether he could come from the back of the field to the front of the field. I had the chance, however, to talk to Scott McLaughlin and Scott Dixon uh, on a completely different subject. And that was the memories that they may have of Pukekohe. Uh, let's take one from David Turner, who joins us via Zoom. David, go ahead, sir. Hey boys, how are you? Thanks very much, Dave. Um, a question for both the Kiwi guys. I'm going to take you slightly off topic here. Final supercar meeting at Pukekohe this weekend. I just wanted to know one thought from you each on what Pukekohe meant to you in your careers. I know for McLaughlin, um, it was your first supercar win. And of course, Scott D, uh, the famous cushion thing. But do you have another memory other than those ones? The cushion? Yeah, the cushion was a good one. Um, I think my first memory actually was the very first time when I was trying to get my license at the age of 13. And I was driving a uh, Suzuki Swift around there um, with a, a steward to sign me off and uh, a family of ducks actually were walking through turn one and I avoided the ducks and nearly rolled the car. <laughs> um, but he still gave me my license, so I, I don't know, it was a fond memory. Uh, but yeah, so the, for, for me, uh, it's probably yeah, my first ever win at, at, in supercars. That was my um, you know, awesome place to do you, win your first race. Um, at home as well. But yeah, it sucks it's going. It's a great track. In between all this, the Indy Lights cars were out on track. They had two races this weekend, one Saturday, one Sunday. And the all-important all thing really was the battle for second, third and fourth in the championship. Linus Lundquist really had the championship title sewn up. Uh, he still had to finish this first race to make him champion, and then obviously the second one as well to really celebrate the whole event. But the battle for second, third and fourth was massive between Stingray Rob, Matthew Brabham and of course New Zealand's Hunter McElroy. In the end, McElroy finished on the podium and kept his chances alive, but there was a poor qualifying performance for his second race, which meant he would start further back in the field. And that was, I think, going to play into things. But at the end of the day, it was Stingray Rob that dominated this thing. And also it was an Andretti 1-2-3 in Indy Lights. Well, what ultimately happened is it was a clean sweep for Andretti Autosport both days, taking the podium clean sweep Absolutely both days, race one and race two. In the first race, it was McElroy that finished third on the podium. And it was a great drive for him. Very gutsy near the end, had some moments, but held the car in there. It was suffering a bit of damage, but it was the true grit and determination that got that car home third. And for McElroy, it also meant that he took out the Rookie of the Year title. So naturally, as always, I talked to IndyCar and we were able to talk to Hunter at the post-race press conference. There was a few issues on Zoom, but you get to at least hear from Hunter on what has been a fine second half to the season for him. Go to David Turner, who is uh, patiently waiting on the Zoom. Go ahead, David. Hey, morning, everyone. Uh, well done, Stingray. Obviously, this is for the Kiwi boy, McElroy. Um, Hunter, first thing, I've got two questions for you, really. The first one is... How, how good is it to know that you're going to be back in this car again next year and you're signed up with Andretti already? It's really good. Um, I feel like it, it kind of takes a little bit of your mental space. Uh, or, or I guess, you know, at this point in a lot of years of my career, I've been in the back of my mind wondering what am I doing next year? So this is the first time probably in my career I've had that safety net of knowing where I'm going to be. And uh, that's really nice. So that feels great. Um, and yeah, I think obviously we've got one more day of school tomorrow um, for the 2022 season, but uh, I think 2023 is shaping up to be really strong. So like I said, it's I've been trying in some ways not to think too much about it because uh, like I said, with obviously Linus has won it, but we're fighting all for the P2 and the points. So um, I've been trying to focus on that for now, but yeah, it's nice for sure. 
And hi, DT. Good to see you, man. <laughs> Thank you. And then the second part of the question, obviously, we talked a lot, you know, when I was up and, and saw you earlier in the year, but you've done a bit of a Dixon-like season here. You've been so strong in the second part of the season with race wins and and everything and not taking it away from the two guys sitting next to you, but it's been a really strong second half. Um, that's the mental mindset game, because I know we talked about it, but you, you've you learned a lot out of that first part of the season that you've converted in the second part, haven't you? Yeah, I think it's just like a bad day. And a bad day at the start of the year was crashing from an easy win or DNFing and getting no points, whereas a bad day in the second half of the year has been fifth. So I think that's a good lesson to learn, um, which I've learned is just being a bit more solid. Even even today, I kept, it was quite a bad day, to be honest, just with some stuff that went wrong, but we're still on the podium. So um that's probably been the biggest thing is just the state the days where you maybe not quite where you want to be still being able to to get a decent result out of it has been the biggest thing well i know you're making your dad really happy because i hear from him often enough so um uh, look congratulations on that congratulations to all three of you look forward to seeing you in the final race of the indy light season um presented by cooper tires tomorrow well, that was the Indy Lights Championship done and dusted for another year. Great, great car count and talks of more cars there next year. Uh, it, it's just a fantastic thing to see. They'll, of course, next year change from the Cooper tyre that they've been with for many, many years to the Firestone tyre, part of Roger Penske's move of bringing Indy Lights under his IndyCar banner while Anderson Promotions look after the early tiers of the Road to Indy programme. And again, I can't stress how good this programme is. It has progressed the likes of a Hunter McElroy from USF2 2000 to Pro Indy to Indy Lights and of course he's back there again next year with Andretti Autosport and I think that that's a great thing. It's uh, it's a good thing to go in with consistency and that's what we should see out of Hunter McElroy next year. Anyway, onwards to the race that counted for everything. It was the final round of the NTT IndyCar Series. One race, winner take all. Favourite, of course, Will Power. Starting on the front row, as he said, all he needed to do was lead that first lap and pick up another bonus points for being a lap leader. And that was the game plan. And as always, it was the low-key Will Power that we've seen this year. Mr. Consistent rather than Mr. I must win. And I think that was the big difference in Will this year. He just drove to do what he needed to do. And he was later to admit that there was times where he could have gone for race wins, but he knew settling for a second or a third was better in the overall hunt for a championship. And that's a true mark of a driver that's thinking about how to win a championship rather than just going for glory in one race. So congratulations to him. The race itself, well, it wasn't too bad, really. Tire strategy did come into it, multiple pit stops. Um, Joseph Newgarden obviously made his way all the way through the field. Fantastic performance from him to do that. Great strategy from the Penske team. They started on the dark a black tyre uh, and played a bit of a strategy game as well and it tended to work for them but not enough to take the championship. Alex Palau on the other hand in the last quarter of the race just simply drove away from everyone and was to win by over 30 seconds. A margin not even heard of these days in IndyCar and here he was to do it on what could have been his last race for the Chip Ganassi Racing Squad. So it was a great testament to Alex, great testament to the number 10 team led by Ricky Davis. Just fantastic performance from them overall. But in the end, the story of the weekend was that we have a two-time IndyCar champion in Will Power. And I got to talk to Will straight after the race. Uh, of course, he's chiming in. David Turner, go ahead with Will Power. Well, we've got to keep it Australasian, and uh, congratulations from New Zealand, Will, and I'm sure your your country, Australia, just across the ditches, outstanding performance across the entire season from you. So a big congratulations. My question to you, because it's been uh, in the media here a lot recently, just about Formula One things, but IndyCar can hold its head very high when it has a champion like you and you're consistent across all the disciplines of circuits that you go to. It's not about being good at ovals or road courses. You have to be consistent across the lot, don't you? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you can't, you cannot be leaving anything on the table. And that's what makes this series so tough and unique is that you've got all these disciplines. And even the difference between a road course and a street course is quite significant in our series because the street courses are extremely rough and bumpy and tight. Um, there's not a series like it. It is, I'm going to say it's the toughest series in the world because of what you got to master to win it and the competition level. You don't even have to take my word for it. Just do the math on lap times and you'll see that we're the toughest, the most competitive series in the world. 
when, when you look at it today and just using Dixon as the example and someone who qualifies midfield and, and you're just further up the road, it, again, it's that same thing. The, the series is so equal. People look at it and go, he's midfield, but it's thousands of seconds separating you guys and qualifying. It is. It's uh, Where were we at Portland? I was like seven-tenths covered 20 cars. Seven-tenths covering 20 cars, like... You're not never going to see that in something like Formula One, never. It's the ultimate drivers series. Yeah, you know, just the ultimate drivers series. Well, I, I fully agree on you, and I was just interested to hear that from you as well because I've been a firm believer of the fact that IndyCar is without a doubt probably the leading open wheel category in the world, and uh, you're a fitting champion, two time title champion now. So congratulations from everyone down here, everyone that follows my show. And to everything that you've done for the media this year and turning up to these press conferences, because I can say honestly, we really appreciate it. So thank you very much, Will. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So all in all, a few things changed at the end of the day, and that was the fact that Dixon finished the championship in third. McLaughlin, however, got up to fourth, and Ericsson was a bit of the loser on the day and dropped down a couple of places. So... Uh, I've said it before, those double points at Indy mean a lot, but you've still got to carry on for the rest of the season. And maybe we didn't necessarily see that from Marcus. I think we did, but it just shows you how tough this championship is and how quickly the points can sway. So, fantastic series. It's a long, long break now till February next year when the season kicks off again. There'll be some pre-season tests and post-season tests and amongst all that, and some driver tests as well. There's much talk of several drivers testing for different teams. But for now, the season's come to an end. It is a long break. Uh, I think we'll miss it, but this is the virtual of going up against the mighty NFL on television in the US and the change in the weather as well. Great season, great effort from everyone in IndyCar, and I'm sure next season will be no different. I think there's a lot of positives that you can take from this season for our Kiwi guys too. So let's look at Scott Dixon, third in the championship. He set the fastest four lap average in qualifying at Indy to take pole this year the fastest lap average ever, so congratulations on that. It was another season with wins, he took out two race wins this year. He finished, this is a really big stat, he finished every single lap of the season, every single race lap. Now just think about that for a second, and that is a pretty tall order. The weakness I think was qualifying, which we've mentioned, but at the end it was the 16th time in 17 years that Scott Dixon has finished within the top four. Now that is the mark of a true legend. But a legend in the making was fourth in the championship and that was Scott McLaughlin. He took race wins this year, he took pole positions, he led the championship and he went into the final in championship contention. His error probably was maybe qualifying at Indy 500, but that was a team error. They chose to go back out there when the wind was changing and the temperature was changing, and ultimately he went slower. It's not all the driver to blame for that one, but that was probably the only thing, in my eyes, that put a bit of a mark on the season. The rest of it was a big, big tick. And while we're giving the Kiwis a bit of a wrap, Hunter McRae, yes, he ended up fourth in the championship, but he's back there again next year. He took race wins, two of them. He took a pole in the very first round of the series at St. Pete and said, hello, Indy Lights, I've arrived. He became the Rookie of the Year for 2022. He had an average start to the season, but I think a lot of that was pressure. And this is a continuation of what the road to Indy is about. It is about making the ultimate athlete and driver and making them hard and aware of all these situations. But he had a tremendous start or second start of the season and it was a great second half that really cemented Hunter McElroy as the Indy Lights Rookie of the Year. The other Kiwis, Billy Fraser, he ended up finishing fifth in the championship in USF 2000 and Jacob Douglas 12th. Jacob grew across the season, it was great to see him and Billy actually put in a whole bunch of fine drivers as well. What you've got to remember here is in USF 2000 there was 31 drivers in there so to have Kiwis fifth and 12th I think is pretty good. Fraser, of course, in the second year, Billy in his first. I hope that we see them both back. Maybe Billy steps up a grade, maybe not, but I'd like to see them both back in 2023 because I think they need to be there. They are the great new future of New Zealand motorsport.
Well, 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 onto the gutsy part of the show now, the news segment, and there's plenty of news yet again. And I'm going to start with my first thing, which is a bitch against the FIA. Probably shouldn't be saying these sorts of things, but really, let's just think of the super license scenario for Colton Herter. So they say that he needs to have the super license points to drive in Formula One, and he's about so many points short at the moment. He's got 30, and I think you need 40. But the bottom line fact, as Scott McLaughlin said over the weekend, as an FIA series champion in supercars, he actually has enough points to get a super license and therefore, technically speaking, could drive in Formula One. Colton Herter, because IndyCar isn't recognised by the FIA, doesn't. Now, nothing against any of those drivers, but you just think of the fact that Herter is a multiple winner in IndyCar and runs at the Indy 500, where speeds are in excess of 360k. Surely, FIA, that means the guy knows how to drive. But no, 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 you're saying that without the super license points, you're not going to let that happen. Now, I can understand that because it's protection of F2 and F3, and you don't want to dilute your own series. But I think there has to be a balancing act there, and this is something that I really, really think that the FIA need to think strongly of. The reason I say this is this could change the destiny for several drivers, and here's the scenario. If Pierre Gasly doesn't move from Toro Rossa to Alpine, which we think he will, but it will only happen if Red Bull release him, and the only reason they're going to release him is if they get Herter in there. Now, if they don't get the super license, Herter doesn't go, which means Gasly doesn't go, which means Alpine finds someone that's going to fill that seat probably for multiple years, which means Gasly's chances of ever getting to Alpine, or Alpine I should say, disappear. It also means Herter's chances of ever getting to F1 disappear for a couple of years, because every other deal is going to be locked in and he's going to miss his chance. So it impacts two drivers, and I really don't think that drivers, who ultimately become the innocent victim of this, because these guys are capable of racing at that level, should suffer those consequences. Personal opinion I know, but I'm saying it, and I think that it's something that the FIA really need to think about. In between times, of course, Colton Herter is going to test for Alpine. The story behind that is Alpine are helping Alfa Tori, which has never been heard of before, in evaluating Herter, uh, which I'm sure is helping clear the pathway for Gasly to still get to Alpine, Herter to get to Alfa Tori. But again, it's going to come down to the super license points. There are currently four teams that are opposed to any change or any sway in the super license things, and that is Mercedes, Alfa, um, Haas, and Ferrari. They're all saying, no, 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 he needs the right number of super license points. I'm sure that that's a little bit of a vendetta, Christian Horner versus Toto Wolff. But anyway, we'll see how it plays out. I'll be very interested to see how Herder gets on an Alpine test. It's rumoured to take place between now and before the teams head to the Singapore Grand Prix. So that basically means next week. So I'm sure we'll have some news on that next week. Carrying on a little bit now with our driver, where will they be scenarios. This one played out just this morning uh, in New Zealand time, so Thursday morning as I'm putting this podcast uh, online for you all, and that's Alex Palau will stay at Chip Ganassi Racing. Hmm. Surprise, 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 because everyone was talking about it over the Laguna weekend, so there you go, that's happening. Ripple effect of that, well, he's obviously back. Don't know for how long, but there is now a clause in his contract that says he can test for other series so long as it does not conflict with his IndyCar program. In other words, he could still go and test a Formula One car should a team approach him. I think it's just a nice... Uh, compromise between everybody. What will the relationship be like around the 10 team and the Ganassi environment right now? I think it'll still take a little bit of repairing, but it will come back. The team and the crew guys themselves and Alex, they're very tight and Ricky Davis leads a very tight team. So I think that things will kind of patch themselves up and we'll see Alex back aboard the number 10 next year. I think then, within the Ganassi squad, that just leaves the scenario of Jimmy Johnson. Now, Carvana have said that they want to sponsor the car, so I think now that that's done and dusted, Chip will draw his attention to that, and I would pick that the Ganassi squad remains the same next year. So with all these scenarios playing themselves out, what's it really meant? It's also meant that Felix Rosenquist now stays at Aaron McLaren SP in IndyCar. Fantastic, I think, because obviously um, Alex Palau is not going anywhere, whether it be Formula One or IndyCar with McLaren, rather than being wasted in Formula E. So good stuff there, Zach Brown. I'll give you a tick this week because I gave you a red cross last week, so I'll give you a green tick this week. And it keeps that squad together. It will be very interesting to see how Alexander Rossi fits in with Pato Award and Rosenquist as the team goes to a three-car squad next year. But we now know that that team's locked in for the NTT IndyCar Series in 2023. 
And Formula One news, speaking of another Alex, and it's Alex Albon in this instance, uh, missed the Italian Grand Prix over the weekend with an appendicitis issue, went into hospital to have that looked at and obviously removed and everything, and then suffered some effects from the anesthesia and actually had to go onto a respirator and was in ICU for a while. I've heard since then that Alex is in good form and he's actually still hoping to even be at the Singaporean Grand Prix. Um, but, you know, it just shows you how things can change quite quickly. I think the big impact there is the fitness of these young drivers today certainly helps them when they get into those medical situations. Kiwis overseas, well, big performance from uh, Nick Cassidy in the DTM over the weekend, taking a race win at Spa. Awesome to see in that car. Cassidy's a fine driver. We've seen it in Formula E, we've seen it in DTM, we saw it in Japan for several years. Uh, this guy's got talent and great to see him get his first DTM win on the board. And speaking of wins in the WEC, the World Endurance Championship, Brendan Hartley back at it with Toyota at Fuji over the weekend and they won another round of the six hour of Fuji. So great to see that Toyota winning on home territory, you might say. And there's still another round to come in the WEC for this year, but Hartley really, really stamping his mark in that with Team Toyota. So well done to them. And then to the home front, Western Spring Speedway kicks off again. I'm proud to say that Perspective Group will be looking after the media production once again, so we'll have a lot of news and info for you around that. But the big part of this is the internationals return, international sprint car drivers and international midget drivers. First up for the International Midget Series, 22-year-old American midget racer Taylor Rimmer will hit Western Springs from Boxing Day night onwards across the entire International Series running a Ron Kendall Terminator chassis. Now she's been driving in the US for Keith Coons Motorsport and as I well know having visited Keith's workshop many a years ago with Brad Mosin up there, uh, Keith doesn't take on anyone who doesn't know how to handle a race car so it's going to be very interesting to see Taylor down here and maybe roughing it up with some of the New Zealand boys so can't wait for that really looking forward to it the car looks amazing she's got great talent so that's one to watch out for but before we get to the International Midget Series, we've got the International Sprint Car Series at Western Springs and Robbie Farr, the Australian legend, will return to Western Springs in his sprint car out of Australia. He's one of several that are rumoured to be here for the first part of the season, November 26th and December 3 at Western Springs, part of the International Sprint Car Series. So really looking forward to seeing an Australian back on uh, Western Springs dirt, you might say, and there's rumoured to be a few more coming yet, but two great names that have already been announced for Western Springs Speedway and you'll be able to catch Perspective Group's coverage of the Western Springs Speedway, the quarter mile show on Sky Sport in New Zealand and also the highlights on YouTube, uh, on the Western Springs YouTube page across the season. So I'm sure that anyone who's into dirt track speedway, whether you live anywhere in the world, you're going to want to check that out because we are in for a great, great season and there's many other interesting events that will be tabled for Western Springs this year and we'll release those uh, when we're in a better position to do so but let me tell you they're big. Well whew, there you go that pretty much wraps up this show for another week lots of news in it great season final for IndyCar great season final for Indy Lights really proud of seeing all those Kiwi guys do what they did yes, this year across all those multiple disciplines within IndyCar right from the very beginning of Road to Indy so great to see there. Really sad to see Pukagawi go. Great performance from uh, Shane Van Gisbergen over the weekend, but my standout actually was Andre Heimgartner coming back from that crash he had just a few weeks ago. But sad to see the old lady uh, coming to an end. There's still many meetings there until the first quarter of next year, but that was the last of the big ones, that's for sure. And Speedway just around the corner now, so really looking forward to that. Uh, apart from that, we'll catch you again next week. There's Grand Prix in the wind, and I'm sure there'll be more driver news as this whole scenario around Colton Herta will play itself out again in the following week, and we'll stay abreast of that. Uh, most of all, once again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for the comments that we've had come in. There's been a few from uh, quite a few people really enjoying reading those, and I try and reply to them all as well. So thanks very much for your support and encouragement on the show. Look forward to bringing you another racing world next week. Thank you.